Welcome to our second of three webinars um, looking at the challenges facing coastal communities now and how nature and people on the coast are key to a fair and green recovery. To the agenda, um, today we have an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, they will share with us their research and insights into the challenges facing coastal communities now, as I said. But just before I introduce our first, first speaker, I want to briefly introduce our webinar series. Um, you might have joined us last week um, on the 4th. You might have not. You might join us tomorrow again. So you might, <laughs> you'll be hearing this again. Um, but just to give you an overview, over the past five years, um, the New Economics Foundation has been working on um, uh, understanding the challenges and the opportunities um, to transform um, coastal economies around the UK coast. So five years ago, we launched uh, a paper outlining a common vision for coastal communities. Um, and that vision is that it is possible to create and support good jobs and livelihoods and to have and maintain a healthy coastal marine environment. We called it the Blue New Deal project and similar to the, the more famous Green New Deal, um, but focused on the particular challenges for both people and nature on the coast the Blue New Deal is a plan for huge investment in the economic future of coastal communities to combat the crisis of inequality, climate and ecological breakdown all at the same time. So the UK is an island nation and the Blue New Deal is also an opportunity to um, bring the ocean into our climate and economic recovery discussions. Our UK waters extend to more than three and a half times um, our land area. And yet we seem to pay very little attention to this vast treasure an incredible resource we have. So our approach to driving the Blue New Deal project has been to first acknowledge um, that every day on our coast, there are people already fighting and working towards that vision, but they needed to become more connected. So our goal was to bring together what are still fragmented efforts along our coast to build the power of and to scale up good practice, to make it the norm rather than the exception. So at the end of 2016, um, so four years ago, NAF launched uh, Turning Back to the Sea, which is an action plan that was co-developed with hundreds of people from all regions of the UK coast to deliver that Blue New Deal vision. The plan outlines the approach and the actions, policy and investment needed at local, regional and national levels to help transform the way our economies work. A lot has happened in the past five years we have the damaging impact of austerity that are now better understood um, and that has heavily affected um, coastal areas that incredibly depended on public services and public sector jobs. The Brexit vote happened and we are still living the ongoing risks and uncertainties of a UK outside of the EU with new policy and new trade deals still uncertain, unclear. We have a stronger and more organized climate movement. And after the election last year, we have a large conservative party majority in power. And this year we got COVID-19. So we are today living with multiple complex and intrinsically linked crises and challenges. Um, and many of these structural issues that we have been living with for so long already have been enhanced and also have been made impossible to ignore in this post COVID world. These pandemic times are taking the wrongs and the dirt of our current socioeconomic and political systems from under the carpet. And as they become exposed, it has to be inevitable that the time is now to make the deep changes we need to make in our society and our economy um, deliver really happier people, um, improve the way we live, to make our communities more resilient to all of these challenges and to really invest and cherish our, on our relationship with nature. So to me, the Blue New Deal for the UK coast has never been more um, relevant. We've done the work, we know what needs to happen and we know how to transform things. Now there is a public debate and the necessity for government to support a green and fair recovery. So what does that mean for our coastal areas? So that's the big picture context um, I just wanted to give you for all of the three of our webinars. And in the webinar last week, we heard from different projects and initiatives in coastal communities in England and Scotland. Speakers shared successes and learnings from work over the past five years to deliver local change and discussed the real challenges of doing things in places against the backdrop 
of an economic and political system that doesn't always support transformative efforts. Today for the webinar, um, today we will zoom out and hear from research and analysis into the structural issues facing our coastal areas, placing coastal challenges into a broader national context. This showcasing of different pieces of evidence is important given the constant struggle of coastal voices to translate the lived experience and complex challenges on our coast into political action and policy change. So now I want to hand it over to our first speaker. Um, Scott Korth joined the Social Market Foundation in 2017 and is um, their research director. As well as managing um, the Social Markets Foundation, Social Market Foundation's research team, he authors research on a wide range of topics, including consumer markets, taxation, low pay, housing, and technology. Before joining the SMF, he was head of macroeconomics and a director at the economics consultancy Seber. I'm not sure I pronounced that right, I'm sorry, where he led much of the consultancy's thought leadership and public. Um, and public policy research. Scott's expert insights are frequently sought after in publications, including the Financial Times, The Guardian, The Times, and The Daily Telegraph. And he has appeared on BBC News, Sky News, Radio 4, and a range of other broadcast media. So we're really pleased to have Scott here um, to share with us um, some of the research he's been doing on, on coastal communities. So Scott, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Fernanda. And I'm aware I've got a sort of strict timing limit on how long I can speak for, so I'm going to try and stick to that. Um, so the Social Market Foundation's produced a couple of reports on the topic of coastal communities. And really, we got started looking at this issue because we felt from an economic perspective, it was under-researched. Um, and I think some of the issues here relate to the fact that a lot of the government data sources make it quite hard to analyze coastal communities. So we tried to undertake a series of analysis, which with given the data limitations that do exist, tries to paint as accurate a picture as possible of what is going on in our coastal communities. And so what I wanted to do in the, in the seven minutes I have to speak is give a quick overview of what's come out of that research and what I think are some of the, the key points here around challenges faced by coastal communities. So the first thing that we noted in our, in our research is that coastal communities across the UK have an issue with low pay. Low pay is much more pervasive in coastal communities than inland communities in the UK. And we calculated that in 2018, there was a wage gap of about £4,700 in terms of average pay in coastal communities compared with inland communities. So that's a huge difference in how much people are earning on, on average in coastal communities. Low pay is pervasive. Not only that, but economic growth has been more subdued in coastal communities in recent years than other parts of the country. So we estimated that between 2010 and 2017, looking at the recovery from the financial crisis, uh, the coastal, coastal economy of Britain grew by 7.5%. That compares with 17.1% of the rest of the for the rest of the country, and we calculated that there were a third of coastal communities that hadn't recovered from the financial crisis in terms of um, economic output. So a lot of coastal communities remain well down on where they were before the financial crisis, and many still have to recover from the from the financial crisis. So even before this pandemic and the deep economic toll that that's um, brought the country these communities were struggling. And the key drivers of that, I think, are twofold. One is the aging populations of a lot of coastal communities. A lot of coastal communities have suffered from a, a brain drain and a, a shift of younger people out of these areas and a general aging of the population. <clears throat> and then I think the other key issue here is the industry mix in a lot of coastal communities where you, you don't have um, as many high paying businesses you have a, a lack of professional services firms, a lack of high-end manufacturing firms, and you see a, a, big, <clears throat> a big concentration of lower paying industries in these communities. So I think that is a big part of the low pay story is we don't have those high value added industries basing themselves on coastal community, in coastal communities. And if we want to address the problem of low paying communities, I think we need to give a lot of thoughts 
to how we can improve the industry mix in coastal communities. So we do have these firms that offer higher wages basing themselves in coastal communities. One thing we identified in our research was that there are a number of infrastructure challenges in coastal communities. Generally, it takes longer to travel to centres of employment in coastal communities, and it's also generally takes longer to access public services such as hospitals from coastal communities. So if we want to get serious about improving economic growth in coastal areas, I think we do need to look at things like road and rail infrastructure to improve their connectivity. And increasingly, of course, the issue of broadband um, connectivity as well is going to be a key determinant of whether well-paying businesses base themselves in an area. As well as looking at the economics, our research explored the health impact, the health outcomes of those living in coastal communities, where we identified a couple of key points. So one is a widening life expectancy gap in coastal communities, where uh, the life expectancy of those living in coastal communities is falling behind the rest of the UK, and that's something that's emerged since the year 2000. And if you look in the, the, da the data around um, self-reported health outcomes, so the proportion of the population that say they're in, in poor or, or very poor health, coastal communities come up quite strongly here. So half of the, half of the bottom 10 local authorities in terms of health outcomes, that is the 20 local authorities where um, the most, most number of people say they're in poor or very poor health. Um, half of those are, are coastal, coastal areas. So places like Blackpool, for example, feature on that list. So coastal communities are overrepresented in terms of areas with poor health outcomes. So thinking about this pandemic and what that means for coastal communities, I think what our research has identified is both economic and health challenges by the coast. And clearly these are both relevant to the pandemic is coastal communities were showing um, um, worse health outcomes before the pandemic. And therefore these communities were probably quite exposed to, to COVID-19. And then on the economic front, as, I, as I've outlined, these are, many of these areas hadn't even recovered from the, the global financial crisis. So they were entering this pandemic recession in, in quite a weak state as well. And thinking about some of the industries that are quite prominent in, in some coastal areas, like retail and hospitality, these are, these are the sectors that have been very much impacted by the pandemic. So that industry mix has probably not been helpful as well in terms of the, the, how the economy is fared in coastal communities during the pandemic. One thing I've sort of noted here is whether there might be an opportunity going forward with the rise of home working, could that help bring more, more jobs that pay well to the coast? And could home working actually be an opportunity to, to bring, bring more, more individuals back to coastal areas and reverse some of the brain drain that we've seen? So I've, I've noted this here as a, maybe something to discuss later on around whether the rise of home working and the potential to sort of disperse talent across the UK could, could be a benefit to coastal communities. Um, so I'm going to end now with just with a few thoughts on where we think government should go from here. So firstly, I think we need better measurements of the coast, coastal economy of the UK. A lot of the official statistics don't make it particularly easy to measure what's happening to coastal economies. And having a better measure of, of the UK's coastal economy would be really invaluable, I think. Secondly, I think we need to do more to bring higher paying businesses to coastal communities and there might be a role for tax incentives and enterprise zone style policies to attract uh, a broader range of businesses to coastal communities and have a more vibrant and diversified economy and one that's perhaps less seasonal and less dependent on certain industries. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, I think infrastructure is really important here and increasingly that's about broadband as well as transport. Um, but at the moment, coastal communities have uh, relatively poor infrastructure and that's something I think needs that needs to be addressed if we are to tackle the economic challenges in our coastal areas. Um, so I think I spoke for seven minutes so I'm going to keep quiet now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Scott. Um, yeah just to, to tell the audience that um, I've given all the speakers
hard task of talking about, you know, lots of research and, and, and time that has gone into looking at um, so many of these challenges to about like five to seven minutes. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for doing that um, so succinctly um, and some really good points that you raised there, Scott, that I'll save for our discussion later. So I want to introduce our second speaker now. Um, our second speaker is Alex Davenport. Um, and he's a research economist at the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Alex um, joined the IFS in 2019 and works in the industrial organization and demand sector. His current work focuses on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic around the UK on spending and employment. Longer term work looks at the government's um, leveling up agenda, the impacts of this de-industrialization on local labor markets and accompanying place-based policies. So Alex, I will hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, I'll uh, share screens for the slides. Uh, okay, so um, so thanks for inviting me to speak and also uh, thanks for that really interesting first talk. I think I'm probably gonna echo quite a few of the messages from that. So um, I'm gonna summarize two, uh, basically the, the findings relevant to coastal towns from two recent IFS reports. Uh, one on the geographical impact of the COVID-19 crisis and the other one leveling up, which also looks at how COVID-19 might impact that. So just to summarize the kind of key messages that we're going to find if this will, yeah. Um, basically coastal areas look very badly hit on multiple aspects of the kind of shorter term COVID-19 crisis. Um, at the same time, they are already struggling and kind of considered left behind and would have been prime targets for the government's leveling up agenda even before 2020. Um, so this means that the policy challenges coastal areas face are quite distinct and different to other areas. They're going to need support both short term to deal with the impacts of COVID-19, but also already needed support to help tackle longer term and deep rooted issues that have been around for a long time. So first of all, looking at the geography of the COVID-19 crisis, um, basically this started from the premise that it's quite a complex crisis. It strikes on different fronts. So a normal crisis that we'd look at would probably just be economic, but COVID-19 has clear health implications. That, in, that complicates the crisis. And there's also a social family kind of element relating closely to the school closures that occurred in the first lockdown. And so we look at three basic, three main measures, health, workers and families. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail on these measures because we don't have time now, but we did, this, uh, we did this analysis on an upper tier local authority level and kind of combined different bits of information into indexes for each of these. So just to summarize the main measures. Um, so we started off with health, obviously that's the main aspect of this crisis or the main cause of this crisis, um, accepting that COVID-19 particularly impacts certain groups badly. So we look at information on age and comorbidities of the disease and where it might be worst hit. And kind of unsurprisingly, and building on the previous previous talk, um, rural and coastal areas look particularly badly hit. This is because they're older, they're popular retirement destinations, but incidences of the comorbidities are also higher in these areas. In contrast, cities, for example, look much less vulnerable on this health front. Uh, we then look at the uh, the work aspect of the crisis. So this is the share of employees working in sectors that were shut down during lockdown, mostly hospitality and tourism and retail. Again, coastal areas alongside cities this time look the worst hit. They have large hospitality and tourism sectors, uh, large retired, uh, so large service, uh, large industries helping look after retired people and also um, large tourism sectors. And so this means that they might be particularly vulnerable to the economic impacts of the crisis. Uh, finally, we look at the family aspect of the crisis. So children are particularly vulnerable to school closures um, in urban areas and some coastal areas. And this looks particularly bad. Uh, so this relates, we, we measured this using free school meal provision and child protection plans. So looking at children that might be at risk of harm, going hungry or falling behind in their education as a result of the crisis. Uh, this, this generally correlates quite highly with deprivation. And so some coastal areas and uh, urban areas look most badly hit on this measure. So we brought this together then to look at where it's hit on multiple measures. So this map shows areas in the top half on two or more of these measures. And the main conclusion from this for coastal areas is that, as you can see from the orange shaded areas, coastal areas are generally hit on the worker and health measures. And so they tend to be more badly hit on multiple fronts than the average area. Uh, in addition to this, of the areas that are hit on all three indices, so the darker shaded areas, many of these are actually coastal. So you can see coastal Northumberland, Torbay, the Isle of Wight and Dorset in the south as well as parts of coastal Lancashire and a high proportion of the areas that are most badly hit appear to be coastal. And so although the whole country will suffer as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, coastal areas look particularly in need of short-term support to help deal with this. So in our second report we then looked at how this might affect the government's levelling up agenda, accepting already that 
coastal areas might be badly hit by the COVID-19 crisis. So before COVID-19, the government had already committed to levelling up left behind towns and cities in the UK, and coastal towns featured quite prominently in this. Many coastal towns are considered quite left behind, as the previous talk also outlined, um, and would have been prime targets for support from this. Since COVID-19 came along, uh, the government's also linked this agenda to recovery from this crisis with its Build Back Better agenda, which is now often talked about in the same vein as the levelling up agenda. So just to shed some light on how this might how this might be relevant, we look, we constructed a measure of where's left behind in the UK. Uh, we combined information on pay, employment, skills and incapacity benefits to try and identify where, where the government might have been targeting levelling up. And then we look at how COVID-19 might complicate this picture using a specifically economic measure of COVID-19's economic impact. In contrast to the previous report, we did this on a lower tier local authority level, which does actually allow us to slightly better isolate specific coastal towns. Although as, as the previous talk explained, the data is not perfect for doing this. So this map here shows where we identified as being left behind. The red shaded areas, particularly the darker red shaded areas, considered those most left behind. And there's no single place that fits the description of left behind. It's a variety of places that fit this, but there are some key trends that emerge. Uh, in particular, post-industrial towns in the north of England and South Wales, large cities outside London, where the UK seems to do particularly badly relative to other countries around the world, and coastal towns as well. You can see that coastal Northumberland, Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Clacton, Margate, Blackpool, and coastal Wales as well, all look particularly left behind on our measure, which isn't that surprising, but it does highlight quite how quite how struggling many of the UK's coastal areas have been in recent years. So we then also looked at this economic impact of COVID-19 and then which focuses purely on the economic side, um, augmenting the shutdown sector's information with stuff on furlough and job vacancies. And then we interact this with the left behind area and this map shows areas that are in the top fifth of areas on either the left behind measure or the COVID impact measure or areas that actually look badly hit on both. So the, the kind of core message of this was that in general, the places hit badly by COVID-19 were not badly left behind, but there are important exceptions, uh, which are shaded red in here. And mo many of these exceptions are actually coastal areas anyway. So you can see again, coastal Lincolnshire, Norfolk, West Wales, as well as some of the coastal areas in the South of the UK and Blackpool all look badly hit by COVID-19 and were already struggling. And these areas will probably face particularly acute challenges. If you were to broaden out the definition of our top kind of section of impact, perhaps to the top quarter or third, even more coastal areas would look badly hit on both measures. So just briefly then, some of the policy implications of this for the levelling up agenda. So in general, COVID-19 vulnerable areas are often different to those that were left behind. And traditional measures of deprivation don't actually capture vulnerability to COVID-19 that well. They perhaps capture vulnerability on the kind of family aspect I talked about earlier, with children who were live in deprived, perhaps suffering more as a result of school closures but they don't capture the economic aspects, uh, aspects well at all. This is an atypical crisis. It's often industries like hospitality and tourism that were generally doing fairly well before the crisis that are actually being hit. And so targeting the same places with COVID-19 recovery support as for leveling up on these measures might not be a good idea. In addition, COVID-19 is a kind of more short-term problem. Left behind areas face very long-term challenges that are quite deep rooted and have been a go stretching back 30 or 40 years to when the fishing industry first declined or tourism perhaps declined from what it used to be. Perhaps mixing these two things up and targeting areas, you know, targeting the same policies to deal with these shorter term and longer term issues isn't generally a good idea. However, we, you know, coastal areas might be an exception to this. It's often the same places being hit when you look at coastal towns. They're already struggling and they're being hit by COVID-19. And so there could be a case in those circumstances for mixing the two policies up. And you can think of some policies like investment in skills, for example, that might help deal with both. People may need retraining as they move to a new industry after this crisis. The skills gaps are often identified as one of the things driving left behind towns anyway. And the same could be true of infrastructure investment that could provide some short term boost, but also help deal with the long term isolation of coastal communities. So uh, that's that's all from me. Hopefully I've kept that to the right time. Um, thanks. I'll uh, try and stop the screen share. Thank you so much, Alex. You have absolutely stuck to time. Um, thank you for that. And um, really interesting as well, um, presentation and, and more um, thoughts um, for us to discuss um, later. Um, and you know, you mentioned that you might be repeating 
um, some of the messages from Scott. I think we're going to hear that throughout. Um, <laughs> and that's one of the, the, the points we want to make, really, is that, you know, di different, different um, approaches to, to looking at different challenges are, are reaching some, you know, common, common conclusions. So, all right, I will now introduce our next speaker. And that's Daphne Papotsaki. <laughs> and <laughs> Daphne is research fellow at the Institute for Employment Studies. Um, she is an applied economist with interest in labor economics, household finance, and the economics of migration. She has worked on projects for the Low Pay Commission and the Social Mobility Commission. And more recently, she has been working on weekly vacancy analysis looking at vacancy trends during the pandemic for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. I'm very happy to introduce Daphne. Daphne, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I will share my screen now. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much uh, to the New Economic Foundation for inviting me to this very interesting event. Uh, in this presentation, I will give a brief summary of the labor market conditions in uh, coastal areas using online vacancy data from Azuna and uh, building on work funded by the Joseph Foundry Foundation. I will focus uh, particularly on a subset of coastal areas classified by the ONS as remote or coastal living. So these areas are highlighted on this map in a light green color, as you can see, and include the typical uh, holiday destinations, such as uh, Cornwall, Great Yarmouth, and uh, Scarborough. This graph shows the index time series of vacancies for uh, coastal areas in the blue lines plotted against all other areas in orange. So the solid lines are 2020 data and the dashed lines are the equivalent values of uh, 2019. As you can see, following the lockdown in late March, the number of vacancies declined sharply in all areas. Uh, however, uh, somewhat surprisingly, we see that coastal areas have been less badly affected by the crisis than other types of areas, at least in terms of uh, vacancies. And we can actually, uh, see this more clearly in this graph that shows the percentage difference in vacancies in 2020 versus the same period in 2019. For instance, um, if you look at uh, the low point for vacancies in May, coastal areas were 50% down on 2019 levels, while other areas were 70% down. <clears throat> now, although the proportional decline has been lower, Coastal areas are starting from a lower base to begin with. So if we look at vacancies per worker in this graph, uh, we can see opportunities for those living in coastal areas were already limited relatively to other areas before the lockdown and remain so during 2020. To understand those patterns, uh, we need to look at the types of jobs in uh, those areas. So here we see the distribution of vacancies across the 10 most frequent job types, types sorry, identified by Azuna in coastal and in other areas in 2019. Now, whereas IT and engineering jobs were amongst the most frequently advertised in other areas, we see that in coastal areas, hospitality and catering and social work were much more important. Healthcare and nursing jobs were amongst the most frequently advertised jobs in all areas in 2019 as well. Now in 2020, the most notable pattern is an uptick in logistics and warehouse jobs as the economy starts depending more and more on deliveries probably. Uh, in coastal areas, hospitality and catering were hit particularly hard uh, during uh, the lockdown as you would expect, of course. Now it is important to talk about the pay uh, in the job types that are prevalent in the coastal areas and in other areas. So the sectors in which coastal areas have more vacancies are typically low paid, just like Scott mentioned earlier. And as can also be seen from the wage distributions of predicted salaries of the advertised jobs on this slide. Uh, most jobs in logistics and warehouse and social work fall in the 15,000 to 25,000 wage range, while most IP jobs fall in the 35,000 to 45,000 wage range. Now, in this graph, uh, we're looking at the number of furloughed workers as a percentage of the working age population by area type. Uh, we see that uh, remoter coastal areas 
uh, living, sorry, have accessed the furlough scheme at a lower per capita rate than other area types, which is possibly because employment in more, is more concentrated in essential sectors like healthcare and social work in remote or coastal areas. And uh, as we can see here in this graph that shows the percentage of workers that were furloughed by sector, it is actually the fact that uh, health and social work had one of the lowest rates of furlough access. On the other hand, of course, the next most prevalent sectors in coastal areas, which are accommodation and food services, had one of the highest rates of furlough access. So this suggests that hospitality was one of the main drivers of furloughs in coastal areas. Now, finally, in those maps, we look at the claimant vacancy ratio before the onset of the pandemic and during the lockdown. The claimant count measures the number of people claiming benefits uh, who are actively seeking work. And uh, darker colors represent higher claimant vacancy ratios. And the color scheme is the same in both maps, allowing for direct comparison between the two time points. We see that coastal areas are amongst the areas with the worst labor market conditions in both periods. So overall, I would say that although coastal areas seem to be hit less by the lockdown, this is largely due to already unfavorable labor market opportunities with jobs focused on low pay at essential sectors. However, there are some potentially positive trends for coastal areas. I would like to mention first an increase in staycations, which may continue after the lockdown. And the second a bit, which was also mentioned previously, an increased acceptability of working from home, which could reverse population decline to an extent, at least in some of those areas. So, stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daphne. Um, that's really great. And, and also posing some um, thoughts on, um, you know, the, the opportunities as well, like moving forward um, based on the data and the evidence that you looked at. Um, so that would be something good to discuss as well. Um, so thank you so much, Daphne. I'm going to move on, move us on to the next speaker. So the next speaker, um, and we've been hearing about hospitality sector on the coast. So um, we've got someone who's an expert on um, in coastal tourism um, and coastal hospitality sector. So Samantha Richardson, um, she's director of the National Coastal Tourism Academy. Um, she has directed the research, visitor experience, training and communications programs of the Academy since its launch in summer 2013, including Coastal Communities Fund, um, UK CES and Discover England Fund projects. Sam's work focuses on national engagement and partnerships that will help boost tourism and the economies of coastal communities. Working closely with a wide range of stakeholders, including central government, Visit Britain, coastal businesses, uh, destinations, coastal community teams, and LAPs, the local enterprise partnerships. She led on the creation of the visit vision for the coastal visitor economy and is working with the Coastal Tourism Leadership Forum to deliver its objectives. Sam is currently leading on the England's Coast Project, funded by the Discover England Fund. It aims to attract visitors from Germany, the Netherlands, and France to our stunning coastline. So I'm really happy to introduce Sam. Thanks, Fernanda. Sam, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Fernanda. And hopefully Fernanda is going to uh, share some slides. Um, well, thanks for uh, having me part of today's presentation. Um, I want to start by, I guess, setting the scene on the scale of coastal tourism pre-COVID-19. Uh, Fernanda, have you got the slides? Yeah, sorry. Perfect, thanks. Um, so pre-COVID-19, uh, coastal tourism in this country in terms of spend was worth 17.1 billion for Great Britain and 13.7 billion for England. It supported 21 million overnight visits and 169 million day visits and 210,000 jobs in England. It also comprises an industry of predominantly independently owned small and indeed micro businesses with less than 3% of corporate travel brands based on the coast. In some coastal communities, tourism supports more than 50% of the workforce, although the average is 20%. Can you go to the next slide? Covid happened at the worst possible time for coastal tourism. 
at the end of winter, just pre-Easter, the NCTA forecasts a loss of tourism spend for this year of almost 8 billion across England and 10 billion across Great Britain. And that's before we add in the effects of the latest lockdown. Can you go on to the next slide? Throughout the pandemic, the NCTA have been running business surveys and monitoring um, external data and reports. Behind the forecast, we know that at least 7% of businesses are permanently closed. And in fact, we now believe this to be near 10%. Just before the latest lockdown, three quarters of businesses were operating at less than 75% of their capacity due to the implementation of social, dis social distancing <laughs> measures. 16.6% were planning to stay open longer this year to try and recoup the losses that they had incurred already this year. But that was offset by another 12.5% who planned to close early, hibernate the business and try and survive until the spring. The loss of key sectors that the coast relies on listed here has had a significant impact. And ironically, particularly on those destinations that had diversified over the last few years to attract greater business events, international education and other markets. We had little notice on the easing of restrictions combined with good weather, which led to huge volumes of people, what we would consider new customers, heading to our beaches. This created issues with social distancing, litter, water safety, and this damaged consumer confidence ahead of the summer for our usual audience. There are many businesses that have fallen through the gaps, and in particular, small and BMEs, but many others too. Vanda, can you go to the next slide? A few of the highlights from the latest wave of the NCTA survey show that over two thirds of businesses feel that ongoing government support is needed to survive. And although the extension to the job retention scheme will be welcomed along with the extension to the VAT reduction, many businesses feel that what they need now is grants. They've already taken out loans and it's not enough to cover the survival of the business. 62.5% of businesses say it will take more than a year to return to profit. A third are unsure if they can survive until March 2021. And bear in mind, this is before the latest lockdown was announced. A third of coastal tourism businesses have reduced their staffing levels. And whilst 5% have increased their staffing levels, this was predominantly to provide additional cleaning required to meet COVID standards. 60% of businesses said that they're planning to rethink their marketing proposition or product to aid recovery with most considering adapting new audiences or creating new experiences. Next slide, thanks. Consumer confidence is extremely fragile. Most bookings are happening less than a week before departure and the coast is not typically seen as a winter destination, ranking third and fourth respectively in Visit England's latest data. There is a perception, particularly among government, that the coast was busy this summer, driven largely by the success of the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. But what we actually saw was many more day visitors than normal and a much lower level of staying visitors who typically spend more. Due to the need to pre-book and limit capacity at attractions and venues, visitors couldn't enjoy or partake in as many activities as normal. And this has resulted in a much lower spend across the destination than previous years. We also had lots of what we would call new customers that are not used to our season landscapes. The RNLI had one of their busiest summers and we saw issues with consumers understanding how to use the countryside code. Can you see the next slide? We were also asked to think about how individual businesses have responded. I think before I continue, it's important to set the context here. This is about those who have managed to survive and attempt to recoup losses, not businesses that have done well in a traditional sense. We have seen many fantastic examples of businesses that have adapted and diversified to reach new audiences. Drive-in cinemas were a big hit of the summer. Virtual tasting sessions, tours, restaurants that are now selling direct through a retail market rather than through their restaurant services. But there's some key factors that have influenced the survival of businesses. Firstly, in my opinion, location has made a major influence on whether or not a business has survived. What are the rates of COVID in the destination where the business is located, but also, and not often considered, what are the rates like where your customers are? You'll see in the third quote there from a tier one business whose customers were in tier three, the impact that that had on cancellations. <laughs> 
Secondly, the business's financial setup pre to COVID. Bear in mind, winter is traditionally when a coastal business will invest in refurbishment. So at the end of winter, their reserves are often at their lowest and that's when COVID hit. We saw many businesses fall through the gaps in terms of government support. And you'll see that particularly brought to light in the quote from a business on, number, on the first quote. They now have absolutely nothing left to show as their business has been decimated. The capacity of many of these small and independently owned micro businesses is also a major factor. Do they have the skills and time to adapt and innovate? Their daily operating costs. We see particularly in businesses that are extending their season or closing early really varies on their operating costs. If you have a low rent or a low mortgage, you're more likely to mothball for the winter than if you have a higher rent. And obviously the impact of government restrictions. You can see in quote two, where many hospitality businesses in particular weren't told to close, but it was almost impossible to operate at certain times. So where do we go from here? You can go on to the next slide, Fernanda. Fernanda said earlier, we know what we need to do. And that's certainly the case with coastal tourism. This is our opportunity to reset, pivot, tackle seasonality and build back better. The NCTA have worked with the industry to develop a three year programme that we believe will support the recovery of the sector. It focuses on a mix of business support, product development, marketing and resilience building. We have presented it to government through several avenues, but no um, uptake yet. So we're now looking at getting commercial partners to support the programme over the next three years so that we can return to government and present this as a match investment. We have been successful in getting a shorter um, six month recovery programme through the Discover England Fund, which will enable our project that's focused on targeting international visitors to focus on the domestic market. But consumer confidence is low and there's a long way to go in terms of recovery. Thank you. Hopefully that's seven minutes. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I know, again, there's so much uh, research and, and so many figures and quotes that, um, that you could share with us. Um, but that was a really good overview um, of the work you've been doing. So thank you. Um, I will move us on to our next speaker. I'm really excited about our discussion afterwards. So. Let me just All right, so our next speaker is Will Thompson. Um, he's policy lead at Social Investment Business. Will joined SIB in May 2019 to help transition the Social Impact Implementation Task Force into the Impact Investing Institute. As policy lead, he leads on developing SIB's policy approach and priorities, linking data and learning from the social investment business historic programs and funds with wider trends in the social economy. He's also secretariat to the Social Investment Forum. Before joining SIB, Will was a consultant at a Bristol-based public affairs agency and was secretariat for two all-party parliamentary groups. He has produced a series of policy reports on the evolution for the Bristol Chamber of Commerce and also worked with two social investors based in the West of England. So I'm really happy to um, introduce Will. Um, just before I do, just to encourage everyone to, to share their questions at the Q&A um, box um, so we can go through them um, once we get to the discussion. So I'll hand it over to Will. Hi, thanks, Fernanda, uh, and some really interesting talks so far. Um, I think you've got my slides. Um, so, so I work at Social Investment Business. Um, we're a social investor that provides grants, uh, loans, and strategic support to charities and social enterprises. Um, and I'm going to talk through um, some research that we've done recently on the impact of COVID on coastal communities. Um, and this is going to have a focus more on the social economy. Uh, and so next slide, please. So just to provide some background, um, over the last six months, SIB have been running a COVID and communities data and research project. Uh, so this has been analyzing local transaction data to evaluate the scale of the economic impact of the pandemic on different places and communities in close to real time. Uh, this has been published in partnership with Tortoise Media on their Corona Shock Tracker. Um, and we've also produced our own interactive map that shows the impact on spending at MSOA level. Um, 
Based on our analysis, we found coastal communities to have been disproportionately affected by the national lockdown, with seaside resorts uh, in particular seeing the largest reductions in spending and corresponding spikes in unemployment. Um, and we produced a report in July that evaluated the impact of coastal community, the impact on coastal communities um, and how we might invest in a fair recovery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we've heard about the, the structural challenges facing coastal communities, so I won't go over them again, other than to say that these four are on this slide, um, uh, four characteristics of coastal towns and seaside resorts in particular, uh, made them particularly exposed to the economic impact of the pandemic. Um, and so when you combine uh, our sales data with um, the British Red Cross Vulnerability Index, um, which brings together data sets that cover both health and well-being and socioeconomic indicators, we can see that coastal areas are overrepresented in the most vulnerable quintile of places exposed to COVID-19. Um, and we're also experiencing some of the biggest drops uh, in sales due to their high, higher retail, hospitality and tourism sector compositions. Uh, next slide. Uh, and similarly, here we can see that the rise in unemployment rate between March and April showed a disproportionate impact that COVID had on jobs in, in seaside resorts in particular. Um, and so of the 20 towns with the highest increases in unemployment rate, 18 were coastal, uh, predominantly seaside resorts. Um, and all of the towns that experienced a higher, 3% uh, or higher unemployment rate increase were all coastal as well. Uh, and this has corresponded with a substantial collapse in consumer spending in these areas, as you can see on uh, the map on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so just sort of what, what's happened since, since we published the report, um, it's quite interesting because Penzance and Wadebridge were two of the most severely impacted places over the summer, um, and they saw a protracted collapse in economic activity from April through to July. But uh, more recent data that we've gathered up to October suggests that these two towns have seen a surge in spending towards the end of the summer, um, as high as 80% in Wadebridge. Um, uh, and so this is reflecting the easing of restrictions um, and pent up spending, increased uh, domestic tourism and things like Eat Out to Help Out. However, despite this more recent search, uh, surge, over the past six months, Penzance is still actually in total 30% down on where it was the previous year. And similarly, Wadebridge is 7% down. So uh, these sorts of towns are still gonna struggle as they enter low season. Um, and that's not to mention the added pressure of a second lockdown. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in our policy paper, COVID-19 in coastal communities, we set, we set out a, um, a blueprint for uh, building that better in coastal areas. Um, and this was based around a set of principles for investing in a fair recovery, uh, which we called Revive, um, which focuses on building resilience, uh, promoting equality, giving voice to the communities we support, investing in social infrastructure, having an ambitious vision, uh, which is sort of rethinking how we invest in places and who benefits from that investment. Um, and then also making a better use of data to ensure the effectiveness of our funding. Um, and then on the next slide. Uh, and th so this has coincided with some other work that we've been doing, doing over the past year, which was a data deep dive into one of our historic funds, the Future Bills England Fund, um, which was a government backed social investment fund that saw 142 million pounds of loan, grant and blended finance into 359 charities and social enterprises. It ran between 2004 to 2010 and at its inception, it was the largest social investment fund in the UK. Uh, so from this research, um, three distinctive features of social investment have emerged. Uh, the first is that it's very patient uh, with an average loan length of 13.9 um, years. Uh, it's very flexible. Um, so over 45% of investees received at least one financial variation. Uh, it targets areas of high need um, with over 40% of investment going to the 20% most deprived areas of the country. Um, and importantly for the COVID-19 recovery, uh, it um, creates long-term employment. So three years after receiving investment, organizations had increased employment figures by 16%, which is over 1,500 jobs uh, in many of the most disadvantaged areas of the country. Uh, next slide. And so what does this mean for the recovery in coastal areas in particular? Well, COVID-19 has expressed, exposed the fresh, uh, need for a fresh approach to how we invest in places, um, not only placing increased urgency on the leveling up agenda in coastal areas, but also highlighting what the end goal of that must be, which is to employ, uh, enhance employment opportunities, uh, to in raise incomes and living standards, um, to diversify local economies, uh, and to innovate with new business ownership models that lead to better quality work. 
And this is this is a primarily a jobs crisis in areas with uh, high proportions of low paid and insecure work. So in the recovery, we have a responsibility to invest in uh, good jobs um, with decent pay and working conditions. And according to research by SEK, um, social enterprises provide more jobs by turnover than the private sector. They pay more equitably. They work more often in areas of greatest need and are more rooted in their local place. And we also know from future builders that um, social investment can create long term employment. Um, and it's also about uh, social infrastructure as well. Um, places with stronger communities and more robust social infrastructure have been more resilient and better able to respond to the challenges posed by the pandemic. But left behind places, um, many of which are coastal, as you can see from the map uh, by local trust, uh, they suffer from a social infrastructure deficit. Um, and in coastal areas with uh, stru facing structural socioeconomic challenges, the recovery and leveling up process must include developing social infrastructure that is both accessible and inclusive. And the social economy will be essential to creating and maintaining this infrastructure. We've seen this uh, with numerous social enterprises and community businesses that have pivoted services and redeployed their volunteers to assist with the COVID-19 response and many of the mutual aid efforts. Uh, and next slide. Um, so just finally, we, we set out some recommendations in our report, um, six of them focusing on investment and non-financial support, new business and ownership models and uh, community ownership of local assets. I'm just gonna go through uh, in the interest of time, three that I think are most relevant. Um, the first is uh, to set up a 200 million pound coastal recovery fund of patient flexible social investment. This be using the learnings from future builders and targeted at coastal areas uh, and communities that have been most severely impacted by the pandemic. Uh, this would focus on generating long-term employment um, and repayments from the loan could be returned and reinvested in the local community to ensure public benefit alongside value for money. The second is to establish uh, what we're calling uh, regional holding companies. Um, this would be a debt for equity fund, which would act as a holding company for at-risk businesses that are otherwise viable, but would uh, but experiencing significant disruption as a result of the pandemic, such as hospitality and tourism. Uh, this would help to avoid the economic damage uh, when local employers go into administration and also to ease the growing SME debt burden. And following stabilization, the holding company could divest from its portfolio of businesses and facilitate the transition to more democratic forms of shared ownership. And uh, SIB are looking at uh, developing this idea and taking it forward as a recovery fund uh, in the future. Um, and finally, it would be to expedite the transfer of local coastal assets into community ownership, um, uh, either by introducing a community right to buy um, and or by expanding um, uh, alternative models of community ownership, such as um, development trusts, which can own and manage a portfolio of community assets at scale, uh, which would minimize the risk, which is often found when uh, smaller community businesses uh, take over control of a single asset, but it's, it's a sort of unsustainable business model. Um, so that is uh, the, the whole presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, uh, the report is on our website and I'll circulate it at the end. Thank you so much, Will. Um, and everyone so far for keeping um, to time. Um, we still have two more speakers, so I'll go straight into it. Um, so let me just um, get Will, give Will a little break of the screen. Um, right, our next speaker is also called Will, <laughs> um, Will Jennings. Um, Will is co-director at Center for Towns and professor of political science at public policy at the University of Southampton. Um, Will um, founded, uh, so Center for Towns Think Tank was founded um, with Lisa Nandy and Ian Warren. And um, uh, Will's research, uh, apologies, is concerned with a wide range of issues relating to public policy and political behavior. And he has specific interests in electoral geography, public opinion, political trust, and democratic politics. He has written widely on geographical polarization of socioeconomic and political outcomes in the UK, with a particular focus on growing divides between smaller towns and major cities. He is also elections and polling analyst for Sky News and a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. So I'm really delighted to introduce Will. Um, and Will, I'll hand it over to you. 
Okay, uh, thanks, Fernanda. And I'll stick to my seven minutes. So um, I don't have any any slides. Um, I, I just like to talk a little bit about the work that Centre for Towns has been doing in this space and how it relates to coastal communities. Um, and I think one of the key things with Centre for Towns that we've been really um, keen to emphasize and stress is, a, is about the kind of differences for uh, different challenges facing different types of towns. I kind of I tease Lisa and Ian with Centre for Towns that we're not the Centre for Northern industrial towns with the centre for towns and actually many different towns across the country face many different challenges whether it's market towns coastal towns and so forth and so, so my broad agenda when thinking about polarization and the kind of characterization of a divide between towns and cities I think is very important but actually understanding that the social economic political context of different sorts of towns um, really matters and I think what's interesting with coastal towns for me and the work that we've done over the years is that coastal towns face similar issues to other towns facing long term declines, especially former industrial towns, but they have their own distinct set of challenges um, too. I mean, what I'm going to repeat some of the messages, I think, from some of the earlier talks, because it's kind of the, and the nice thing, actually, is we all, we all seem to be observing the same thing, which on one level is slightly repetitive, but the other level, I think, is important that we have a growing evidence base. And one thing I'd really stress is the importance of looking at lower levels of geography. So while local authorities are, you know, useful, they're a good way of aggregating data, looking deeper down actually can be really important for understanding the challenges facing particular areas. Co there can be coastal towns, communities within broader geographies where the broader geography might look okay but the coastal town might be might be suffering or, or, or vice versa and I think it's really important that we start doing um, uh, more refined work drilling down. In the context of COVID um, we we did some work um, I've just I posted in the chat the um, a link to the report back back I think it was in, in April actually thinking about the long and short term um, challenges of COVID-19 for, for towns. And there's been lots of talk, you know, about kind of V-shaped recovery, but I think that's actually quite important because, you know, in thinking about the immediate impacts of COVID-19, and we've heard a lot of, about those already, that in our early work, and I, I think that's been borne out, we projected the worst temporary hits would be, especially in those places dependent on tourism, leisure and hospitality, especially in the Southwest. And actually when we put out the report, there was a lot of kind of, kind of surprise that some of the towns that were seemed to be projected to be my worst hit were actually quite affluent. They weren't the kind of the classic examples of declining uh, towns or communities that had seen their kind of traditional industries hollowed out. And, and I think that on one hand highlights the importance of the furlough scheme and transition, transitional interventions that although COVID-19 poses major social challenges, major economic challenges, um, uh, that actually it is a transitional problem that we can build back and there can be resilience in terms of those places if we're able to get to the other side of the crisis. Um, uh, but I think those those kind of short term challenges posed by COVID, which I think some of which will kind of flow spill over into longer term um, uh, effects, need to be put in the context of the longer term structural challenges facing coastal economies, whether that's in terms of decline of uh, traditional industries, aging pop, po um, populations or, or, or lack of co connectivity. Um, so and, and just to kind of build, build on that then. So one of the things that Centre for Towns um, has uh, done in its work is really think about the challenges facing uh, towns and, and our measure in terms of that long term analysis was thinking about the kind of long term structural challenges facing places. Um, and I think that uh, we in, in that report, we developed a measure of economic decline that kind of focused on particular things. But I, I think there are three things I'd probably pick out in terms of thinking about long term challenges facing coastal communities. One is around education, educational inequalities. Social Mobility Commission has done a lot of great work thinking about kind of, you know, uh, places with low rates of social um, mobility and coastal towns and, and former industrial towns are the two places which are seen as kind of cold spots of, of low social mobility. And I think that's really important. And understanding the geographical inequalities in terms of education, I think are really important. So although actually population outflows as part of this kind of aging populations are a function of a variety of things about both people retiring to coastal towns, but also the, the, the kind of outflows of young working age populations. Um, and Scott talked, talked about the brain drain. I think there, 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 are, there are other issues there as well that people feel they need to move away to, um, to, to core city economies because the jobs aren't there. And so I think one thing we really need to focus on in terms of thinking about policy solutions is about what sorts of jobs can be created 
in, in coastal um, towns. And of course, there, I think there are, again, when we're talking about coastal communities, I think there are actually within coastal communities there's variation, right? There are different sorts of economies of some that are tourism, hospitality based, some that some places that um, I think if, when I, as, a, as a political scientist, a lot of the early focus on kind of UKIP and the changing electoral geography of the UK was about declining, ta- declining coastal towns with light industry. So there are different sorts of coastal towns that are not kind of traditional seaside towns in that sense. So I think we need actually to have uh, and play, people like Centre of Town should be doing more work on actually the differentiation of different sorts of coastal community, different sorts of coastal economy and different sorts of model because they're not all going to be the same. So just a final um, minute on, you know, what would be the Centre of Town's agenda for the recovery and resilience of places? Well, I think we, we did some work with EY on foreign direct investment and what kind of invest, investors were looking for in places when they were looking to kind of invest in jobs and um, companies in particular areas. And I actually think the, the findings in that report are, are true, I think, for, for much and on a kind of much broader scale, not just about foreign divest, direct investment. And then on one level, really simple. I think this issue of connectivity that's come up again and again is totally crucial in terms of physical and digital infrastructure. You know, coastal towns, I think, in terms of kind of long term economic geography, um, if we think about why coastal communities were successful, it was about, first of all, their connectivity to the sea and rivers, right, which is since which, you know, now we have moved to a, a digital, well, first to a kind of road based economy and then, you know, a kind of digital economy. Coastal towns understandably lack the connectivity. And so what we need to reflect on is how we can enhance the connectivity of coastal communities to the broader UK. I think they, they kind of there are structural geographical issues that um, I think are really important thinking in very long term. I, when, I, when I started talking about UKIP in the context of electoral geography, I was used to use the kind of the seaside pier as an example, as a kind of metaphor for the long term arc of the decline of places that we're not even talking necessarily about post financial crisis. We're talking about decline over places over hundreds of years, right? The kind of the rise of particular forms of economic organization. And actually, if we step back, we can say, well, what would a vision for coastal coastal communities and places for 100 years look like, not for next year post COVID. And the other, the other just to close up, because I know I'm going to go over time thinking I had nothing to say. The, the other thing I'd say is, you know, how the thing that came up in that in that report with EY is housing, people's physical infrastructure. I think one of the real advantages of coastal towns they have to offer if they they can be kind of invested in enhanced is the physical environment that it has to offer people, you know, the kind of the, the, the co- culture, coastal assets of the environment. I think that's what people are looking for when they're looking for housing. But we need to have that kind of connect Activity that allow an and investment in, in places in terms of housing, physical infrastructure. And I think the other key thing is about skills and training. When people, when companies um, are, are looking for places to invest in, they're looking for skills and training. And so there's been a lot of talk about, you know, kind of leveling up and a lot of broad um, kind of um, hand waving around, you know, investment in kind of further education, higher education. But I think we need uh, an emphasis on skills and training that thinks about how we can um, uh, equalize um, the sorts of skills and training that we offer to different parts of the country. And, and the final point I'll make is I think that um, one thing with Centre of Towns we've always said is there is no one size fits solution for the centre of ta- for towns. There, you know, we cannot invest, you know, there cannot be town deals of, of tens and hundreds of millions of pounds for every town. And so what we need to do is think about the models for different places that emphasise that are place based, that emphasise their culture and heritage that reflect the particular strengths and assets and the people in those places and give people um, power to the local communities to, to around community investment, community innovation, the, the people who actually know what is good about an area and what, what it has to offer. And so I think um, while we often will on these sorts of debates think about national level discussions, we really need to start thinking about the sorts of structural changes to democratic politics and policy making that can actually give power back to communities and to allow them to start setting the agenda for how their play their their what how their towns can be turned around. Thank you so much, Will. Um, that's great, and, and giving us a little bit more the, the kind of political um, um, uh, uh, analysis um, and assessment as well. Um, that's great. I'm going to move on to our next speaker just so we can have um, just enough time to answer a few questions, have a little discussion. Um, just before I do, I want to acknowledge that some people send me a message about um, uh, pausing for a Remembrance Day. Um, I apologize um, that we didn't, but um, hopefully everyone um, has been able to, to um, um, honor in their own way. Um, so I'm going to move us on to our 
less, but um, certainly not least, <laughs> however you say that, speaker. Um, I'm really glad to have Rosie Carta with us. Um, she's, um, she's Senior Policy Officer at Hope Not Hate Charitable Trust. Um, and she conducts research on community, public attitudes, identity and political polarization. Um, they just recently launched a report uh, maybe a couple months ago um, now um, with some um, really interesting, um, you know, innovative research um, looking at um, different challenges around the country. So I'll let Rosie speak, um, tell us more about that. So Rosie, I'm handing it over to you. Brilliant, thanks. Um, so for those who don't know, Hope Not Hate is the UK's largest anti-fascist organisation. Um, so that some of you might be wondering why we're here to talk about coastal communities. Um, so as well as kind of monitoring and exposing the far right, we do a lot of work on public attitudes and trying to understand where vulnerabilities to the far right open up and where community tensions open up more broadly. Um, so we do a lot of attitudinal research and we've recently done a bit more kind of place-based research, trying to map some of attitudes to migration, to multiculturalism, down to kind of small geographic areas. And what we've seen is quite clear trends um, that everyone has kind of spoken about so far and will spoken about in the difference between towns and cities and some of these kind of these issues that are kind of much broader that, that underlie some of the, the vulnerabilities to the far right and hostility um, within communities. Um, so many of the challenges uh, that, that coastal communities have create quite fertile soil for the far right. They feed frustrations and resentments that the far right exploit um, and get their teeth into and, and push the blame onto migrants and minorities and look at kind of different places as, as diversity increases elsewhere, but some places feel kind of that they're falling behind. Um, so we wanted to kind of focus a bit more on what can be done to address some of these root causes or the drivers of some of these things, the kind of environmental basis on which attitudes are developed. And really we wanted to look at resilience as a kind of key part of community relations or community um, resilience and, and what we mean by that is places ability to adapt to change and to to kind of maintain good relations when things get hard um, and what we found is that hostility kind of increases most where there's quite a palpable sense of loss and again this isn't just the kind of classic left behind post-industrial but it can be things like arts or heritage assets education people feeling a lack of opportunity or feeling disconnected um, so we recently produced this report, Understanding Resilience uh, in Our Towns, and what we wanted to do with that was really look at what, what community resilience looks like in towns and how we can break that down. So we created an index of all 862 towns based on the Centre for Towns typology um, across the UK, and we, we brought together kind of over 100 in, uh, data points from everything from kind of pub closures through to demographic makeup, education, um, heritage arts, all of these things together to try and understand what it was that was driving hostility mapped against our, our attitudinal heat map. Um, so what we found was that we could create a kind of framework for different types of places and with each having a different set of resilience challenges. So we developed 14 clusters of resilience challenges. And this was everything from places with shrinking and aging populations to those experiencing rapid change, those that had an authoritarian footprint, a history of far right activity, and those that had indu um, uncertain industrial futures. And these weren't kind of mutually exclusive categories, places could fit into multiple groups of these, but one that I'm going to talk about today um, that came out was coastal challenges. So to put this together, I mean, some of the things that, that kind of came up um, for this cluster were having high, high rental churn. Um, so particularly kind of HMOs, high level of kind of not very good and not very well regulated accommodation, um, opioid misuse, um, the fact that they were on the coast um, and pension of poverty. So it was kind of a matrix of these issues that seemed to correlate um, with, with hostility towards migration and multiculturalism on some of our um, data. And I mean, this wasn't regionally specific. Um, so places that kind of fell into this cluster were places like Mablethorpe, Blackpool, Morecambe or Dover, 
all very different places, but shared similar profiles in some ways. And we also found quite a big difference between ports and resorts. So ports also tended to fall into kind of post-industrial clusters um, and had quite different challenges in that way, whereas resorts tended to have different issues. They had older, more settled populations and tended to have kind of a stronger national identity. So these were quite distinct. Um, and our previous research has shown that for some ports that are thriving, we actually found attitudes to immigration much more positive because people would draw on historical experiences of people coming and going. So it isn't a kind of blanket approach, but it is a way of understanding how some of these challenges feed into these um, this kind of attitudes and, and vulnerabilities to, to the far right. So it's not simply cultural or economic, but it's what happens at the intersections between the two. So visible decline in a locality can feed perceptions of kind of moral moralistic decay for those who hold very conservative cultural values. Um, for others, like these things don't happen in isolation or in isolation from other places. So particularly kind of towns along the Kent coast, seeing rapid diversity through East London um, and feeling that they kind of weren't keeping up with, with what was going on. And this kind of donor area effect from large diversity um, where people kind of felt very uncomfortable with things, but weren't quite sure. And a lot of that speaks to, to insecurities that they were feeling themselves. Um, so addressing some of these these issues, I mean, these are big, big questions, a lot of them, um, and how we can address some of these, but but all of them feed into how communities can live well together as well. Um, so I think a lot of the suggestions that people have come up with already to improve housing in coastal areas, to strengthen the tourism industry, all of these things will have a knock on effect on how people see each other and see the world around them. Um, we're also working within this Hopeful Towns project to develop a towns leadership network. So linking localities that share similar profiles to try and share good practice, things that are working and things that, that are working kind of to improve community relations, but also address some of these bigger questions. Um, so largely, I mean, this kind of falls back to, to Hope Not Hate's kind of core mission that we know that where there isn't hope and it's this kind of nebulous concept that whatever that looks like, people will turn to hate. Um, and it's kind of, it, it is a nebulous concept, but we know that we can throw kind of all the, all the street parties in the world, um, but it won't change some of these kind of key community tensions unless we start to address these broader questions um, of resentment and frustration that are falling on coastal communities. So I hope that's in my five minutes. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, yeah, that's absolutely brilliant and a great um, uh, uh, contribution to end on because it, you know it brings some um, other really important um, uh, perspectives and considerations that we need to consider when thinking about all these challenges across the communities. You know, thinking more broadly about how the cultural challenges interact with um, you know social and economic challenges as well. Um, so thank you so much because I don't, I mean, I, I have lots of thoughts and I've been <laughs> enriched by all these contributions. Obviously I've been following all of this work, um, but um, I just wanna hear more from the, the panelists. Um, and so let's try and answer a couple of questions um, and please by all means put, put forward your reflections as well after listening to, 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 to all the contributions. All right, so just to go, um, I, I'll read a few questions, I guess, if everyone can, um, if our panelists can just um, keep them in mind um, and then let's see how we go, just because I haven't had time to, to, to look through them. We have about four um, at the moment. Um, so from Andy Philpott, um, with some UK coastal towns being abandoned due to climate change impact, what kind of policies and investments are needed to turn this around? Um, okay, so the next one is um, not a question, but yeah, I will be chatting with our panelists about um, sharing all the slides and presentations. We've got um, from Joe, um, what role does the broken, in brackets, housing market play in constraining or facilitating the economic development of coastal communities? Right, um, Martha, um, just pose the question, what is the potential impact of more home working? In Bournemouth, we have seen a rise in house prices and people moving to the area, but is this regeneration? 
um, and from Ian regarding well-paid sustainable jobs, are coastal colleagues aware of the current and future opportunities available within the offshore wind industry and its supply chain? The latter covers pretty much all occupational groups. Um, and uh, by definition, most key contractors are coastal based, often education and training provisions are co-located. So there's a question there about um, jobs um, and you know the, the job opportunity that we, we, we've heard a lot obviously about the, the kind of job market um, in coastal areas and the challenges for that and about diversifying as well. So I guess um, that question speaks to that in terms of um, opportunities, the offshore wind industry. Um, we heard a little bit about um, what Scott introduced and others touched on as well um, around home working and the flexibility, you know, the, the new kind of um, type of, of, of work patterns and the potential for that in coastal areas. Um, right, and climate change, which we haven't heard much about. So if anyone wants to comment on that um, and the housing market. So maybe I'll just go around um, our panelists and I'll let them you know, respond to the questions um, if they think it's relevant to them, but also just put forward some um, insight, some, some uh, quick reactions to, to all of our um, contributions. So can I start um, perhaps with um, Scott, bring Scott back in. Sure, well, I'll, I'll try and answer at least a couple of those. Um, so I can't, I can't say I've done any, anything on, on climate change in coastal communities, so I'm not, I'm not going to answer that, I'm afraid. But just a couple of thoughts on the housing market and home working. So I think for me, you know, the, the, impact, the impact of home working on the housing market in coastal communities, you could, you could imagine a scenario where it leads to house prices becoming more expensive in some of these areas. Um, um, as you get a sort of influx of professionals in, into, into more coastal communities. Um, so I think the view I'm taking at the moment is we're probably entering a new, a new, a new normal where you know, people do go into the office sometimes, but maybe the new normal is only like two or three days a week for your typical London, London professional, say. Um, and therefore, people are, are more willing to put up with a lengthier commute and maybe you'll see more people commuting from places like Margate and into London, taking advantage of the relatively cheaper housing costs. Um, that would lead to more expensive housing in some of these areas, um, which is a downside, and unless sort of other, other measures are put in place to correct that. Um, but I think there is, there is an upside to, the, to more individuals moving to these areas in terms of you know, the spending power of these individuals, and in particular, if they're working from home, they might spend more money in the local area um, on the days where they are working from home. So supporting that sort of retail and hospitality sector in coastal communities, which is often often quite seasonal, that could help make it less seasonal, um, having more people spending locally in the week. So I think there are, there are some negatives there in terms of it, it distorting housing markets, but I think there are also positives that would arise from more, more people locating to the coast. Thank you, Scott. Um, in, instead of me picking, I'll just let someone else jump in um, from our panel. Anyone with kind of burning? I mean, I, I, I'll just say something around. I mean, I think the the issue around climate change, the environment, and Centre of Towns is currently working on a report for uh, European Climate Foundation on kind of attitudes towards um, the environment in uh, in towns and cities. And I think the first thing to say is actually the, for homework and the importance of digital connectivity, digital infrastructure, I think, for that side of things. I think if we are serious about shifting to a remote working economy or an economy that has remote working kind of central to central foundation, we need to think about um, broadband. And there are very clear geographical inequalities in terms of broadband quality and speeds that really will impact on, on the sustainability of that as a, as a strategy. I mean, I think for, for one thing, I think around the environmental agenda around kind of coastal communities and towns more generally, I actually think there's some hope, I think, in terms of people like me who write about geographical polarization of politics, there's an emphasis of kind of left behind towns sort of have a pejorative sense of kind of like people holding particularly sorts, particular sorts of attitudes. But actually, one of the things we found in the, in the survey work we've done for European Climate Foundation is actually people in, in smaller towns, uh, kind of rural areas, which kind of encompass 
the coastal communities there's actually people who are concerned about the environment there's actually it's actually it's kind of there's a kind of there's a coalition to be built of um uh, to use the the kind of pejorative language of our age of cosmopolitan city dwellers uh, who are very pro-environmental and uh you know kind of in a more rural small town coastal um uh, kind of uh, the, communities and so I think there's great potential there for an agenda that puts uh, you know kind of an emphasis on environmental quality and place at the heart of um, you know kind of forward-looking um, in uh, economic strategies. Thank you Will. Um, I'll invite another panelist just to say that um, and there was a comment around that we we very much acknowledge um, that coastal communities are not you know, all the same. <laughs> Coasters are not all the same. I think you've heard that through the different contributions, but just to acknowledge that, um, you know, and, and, and we know how complex um, the picture is. So anyone um, from any one of our speakers that wants to jump in with some, and it can just be uh, reflections as well when you've heard anything that has made you think differently about those issues based on the contributions. Yeah, Sam, go on. Um, I just guess picking up on the working from home piece. I know we saw that Right Move earlier in the year published a piece that said that seaside towns were one of the most popular um, search uh, terms with people moving out of London now that they were working from home. Um, in the tourism world, Euromonitor published a piece of research on Monday that um, took it a step further and said, why not work from home? Why not work from anywhere? Um, and the Middle East in particular is a big move on this where hotels that aren't full of tourists are now focusing on offering their, offering their facilities for work from home spaces um, with good connectivity and free Wi-Fi, etc. So, you know, maybe another spin on it there, just a reflection. Thank you, Sam. Um, so just to touch on the um, offshore wind bit, um, in, in our paper, we, we sort of try to distinguish uh, given the, the fact that yeah, there are differences between coastal towns and their economies between the sort of ex-industrial coastal towns like Grimsby uh, and, and Hartlepool and then uh, others like, um, you know, seaside resorts like, um, you know, Penzance and Weybridge. Um, but but we sort of we we said that the the kind of investment that you do that has to be based on the the specific economic and social conditions of that place. And we did look at the idea of offshore wind uh, and the opportunity there, not just for you know growth and jobs, but potentially looking to increase community ownership of energy um, and and basing that on the sort of German model, uh, which has a lot more sort of energy cooperatives and 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 sort of community investment uh, and thinking about how things like community shares could be used as ways of uh, sort of involving people in energy production in their local area and providing a bit more accountability to the people who might live in those towns rather than say all of that investment being extracted by sort of private shareholders you could get a bit more of reinvestment in the community uh, and, and a bit more democratic ownership. Thank you, Will. Um, well, before, if anyone else wants to jump in, but um, just, just to say like my, my reflection and hearing from everyone um, is, you know, the, the, the difference between like thinking about, cause we are in an emergency, um, uh, sorry, urgency, urgency um, state, um, you know, with COVID, with um, obviously climate, if you take it seriously, which we should, um, an ecological breakdown. Um, but I think what, what I take from all the contributions, and I think everyone made that point really well, is that, you know, there are structural um, issues and, you know, we really need to rethink how we um, address and, and build a longer term vision as Will was saying as well, you know, like it's not thinking about the next five years only, it's thinking about the next 100 years. Um, and for that, you know, it will then really potentially change how, you know, where where investment goes. So we need investment, we know that we, we need investment in coastal areas, but where it goes um, to, um, you know, how is it distributed and what is it creating um, is very important. And things um, mentioned by Will, of course, um, Thompson, sorry, we have two Wills. Um, <laughs> others touched on it as well around, um, you know, investing in the social infrastructure of the place, you know, and, and really thinking about that, building the resilience um, of places by not only addressing jobs in terms of quantity, but is jobs about quality, the 
of jobs um, and how um, those jobs and, the, and those activities then support you know uh, more more cohesive communities um, and allows communities to to actually um, build that themselves as well um, so those are really all good points and I think really good recommendations overall and like key messages to policymakers um, you know moving forward um, I want to we have three minutes left um, just from um, the ones we haven't heard from yet if anyone wants to make like just a final contribution um, looking at Rosie Alex Daphne don't have to <laughs> um, so okay so basically um, this webinar I know um, for the audience out there the, those listening to us um, I know it's a lot to take in uh, it's been quite a lot of content um, obviously all these amazing people have you know way more work um, um, to share with you so so please go to their um, um, relevant websites and and look at the links for the reports I will be sharing all of those links um, on a message to you as well everyone who registered for the webinar who were, was able to attend and those who weren't We'll also, we've been recording this webinar, um, so we will make um, it available afterwards. I will check with the speakers about sharing the slides as well once I send that message. Um, but yeah, please continue that conversation. I mean, obviously we would ne never, we're never gonna be able to cover everything um, in the rich discussions we could have, um, you know, in one hour and a half, which was already <laughs> long, I know. Um, but hopefully um, this is a contribution so that we can encourage more of those conversations and, and, and link up more um, in terms of understanding those challenges and how we can address them. So I just wanna thank again, um, all the speakers, I'm really grateful. I know everything was kind of done short uh, notice and that's completely my fault and you've all stick to time. So it's been wonderful, um, very rich contributions. And thank you for, uh, to everyone who joined us today and who um, um, offered questions. Um, yes, so that's it. Thank you so much guys. And please join in tomorrow, same time for the third one. <laughs>